Doubling Your Revenue with Virtual Staff with Brett Tremblay, Episode 128. Are you ready to make your law firm a profit-generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact? With more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit with Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10x effect, Moshe Amsel. Well, hello and welcome to another amazing guest interview here on the Profit with Law podcast. I'm your host, Moshe Amsel, and today I have with me somebody really, really uh, interesting, cool, unique. You're going to be excited to hear from him, but before I introduce him, let me just tell you, if this is the first time you are listening to the Profit with Law podcast, you're in for a treat. And what I need you to do is just look at your podcast player. There's a little subscribe button. Hit that button so that you get notified the next time we release an episode. We have two episodes coming out every single week. On Tuesdays, I do a solo episode. Thursdays, we do a guest interview. We get amazing feedback on our episodes, and I am sure that you are going to enjoy it. If this is not your first time here on the Prof with Law podcast, we'd love it if you just took the moment to rate and review the show. The more ratings and reviews we get, the more likely somebody is to check us out. And this is not about me. It's about you. It's about growing the status and the success of the legal community. So we are now going to jump in and introduce our guest. My guest today is Brett Tremblay. And um, Brett is the uh, founding partner of Tremblay Law Firm, as well as a co-founder of Get Staffed Up. Very interesting, very interesting um, person and story. And I love what he is doing. And I'm really excited to have him here on the show. Brett, welcome to the show. Moshe, thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be with you today. Awesome. So Brett, what I like to do when I bring a guest on is, is just introduce you to the audience. So uh, people are going to want to know who the heck you are, where you're located, what do you do, and how did you get into that? So if you could just give us a brief backstory of your history, uh, I would love to learn more about you and share that with our audience. Well, let me give the quick version in case people are about to turn this off and say, why should I listen? Um, I started a law firm by myself with no assets, no resources. And eight and a half years later, uh, just yesterday, we could finally announce that we hit the Inc. 5000 list. We have 10 attorneys, 23 staff members, and we're still growing like crazy. So if you're just starting a law firm or you've been stuck for a while or, or feeling stuck, then you know maybe this is a good podcast to listen to. And you mentioned Get Staffed Up, and that is the way that we're giving back to the legal community. As you said, it's about growth in the legal field. Too many people are doing what I did, and I could talk more about that, um, where I, I couldn't get my own help. I couldn't hire. I was scared. I was frozen in just fear of, of making moves and losing money and going out of business. It wasn't what I thought was going to happen when I, when I started the firm. And I, I didn't have immediate success. And that was kind of the first time in my life that I, that I didn't, you know, just come out the gate and, and be really good at something. You know, lawyers are, we're used to being overachievers and, and being at the top of our class and everything. And it stemmed from the fact that I was, I was afraid, it was my ego. I was afraid to fail because of what other people would say about me. And so I was doing everything myself. I was licking my own stamps, sending my own faxes. I'm not exaggerating here. And all those things were getting in the way of me being who I needed to be. And some people get that message, but a lot of people don't because they do what I did and they, they lie to themselves and they justify. And I, I can work 14 hours a day and I have to work 14 hours a day because I don't have the money to hire someone. So um, if, if get staffed up, what we do is virtual staffing for lawyers from other countries. It makes it way more affordable. And if, if, if I had known about this concept early on, I think I would be at a different stage because it, it really is, 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 it's growing like wildfire, the businesses, because what we're doing is so helpful for lawyers. Awesome. And we're going to, I'm going to take the second half of this episode to really dive into get staffed up and what you're doing there and how that, uh, that helps attorneys. But before we do that, <clears throat> you said that you just got accepted to the Inc. 5000. What's the criteria for that? And what does that mean as far as your, 
your growth? I know it's just a badge of honor, but but you know what what does that what does that tell people when you say I've I've, I've been accepted to the Inc. Five Thousand? Yeah, well, it, it's not accepted. Unlike your chamber awards, where it's kind of like who you know and your friends and people voting and and kind of made up. The Inc. Five Thousand is a verified revenue list of the top the fastest growing 5,000 companies in the United States over a three year period. So the criteria is three years, yet you have had to be in business three years. So three years ago, you had to have revenues of at least 100,000 minimum. And then in order to apply, you have to be over 2 million three years later. And so if you, if you qualify, then you submit your financials and then you get ranked essentially within the, the 5,000. There's a list from one to 5,000 of the fastest growing companies in the United States. Wow, impressive. So um, what, what do you think were uh, some of the biggest challenges that you experienced over the last eight years in growing the firm from infancy to being, you know, hoping to be one of the fastest growing companies in the United States? I think, uh, well, Tony Robbins says that the, the hang up, 80% of the hang up in a business is the mindset of the owner. And we make thousands of decisions per day that we're not even aware of. So, I mean, I just see so many people online, you know, all these Facebook groups now exist and, and lawyers are going back and forth and they need help and they, and they need resources and somebody will offer a good resource and immediately somebody will respond with, I can't do that. That's not me. I can't hire someone. I don't have time to train someone. And I'm like, where, where do you just make these things up? When's the last time you actually sat down and looked at your day and decided I'm, I'm too busy to be less busy, right? I'm, I'm so busy doing all the minutia in my business that it doesn't make sense for me to take four hours a week for the next six weeks to map out a job description and, and hire someone so that I can delegate more things and free up my time to not only be so stressed, but to, to get more done. And that exercise is not intuitive though. How do you even know that that's the next step to take? And that's where I think lawyers fall off is we were not taught business. First of all, you know, I'd had this conversation with somebody yesterday, schooling probably all over the world, but here in the U S is made for employees. It teaches you how to do good and pass tests and get a job. It doesn't teach you how to give a job and how to be an employer or an entrepreneur school. The school system is not set up for entrepreneurs. Even when you go to business school, they want to teach you how to impress someone else with your business knowledge and get hired. And so lawyers, especially, then we go to law school and we learn how to practice law, or I should even say that all we learn in law school is how to read case law and, and hopefully, you know, make some arguments. And so um, we, we either out of necessity or out of want, we start our own law firms and you're now a business owner, you're an entrepreneur, you're not really, and you shouldn't really be a lawyer anymore. If you do want to remain a lawyer and be the technician, as, as Michael Gerber talks about in the E-Myth, you need someone else running your law firm, even if your name is on it. And there's just so many concepts that, that lawyers don't get. And, you know, backing up to when I was in, in first grade, I sold pencils for money and my parents didn't know. And then I would buy my brother and I things from the vending machines. And, and my, my parents like, like, where are you getting this money from? So, you know, that was kind of how I was as a kid. I was always coming up with ways to make money. And again, so I kind of fancied myself an entrepreneur and, and, you know, I have different business stories throughout my youth, but I thought, well, I'm an entrepreneur. I know how to, how to run a business. It's just not the same. Lawyers don't know how to run a business. I know I'm speaking your language now, Moshe, because that's what you do. You're, you're a mentor, a coach, and you help people grow their businesses and figure out what they need to do. But just like, you don't know what you don't know. So I didn't even know that there were resources and that I should be reading them and I should be spending most of my time learning how to run a business instead of trying to network and be a good lawyer. And that was, that was my biggest hang up. And it goes back to the mindset of the things we just tell ourselves all the time that, that we don't know any better. You know, it's interesting. There's two things that you said that I want to go back to. Um, one is you mentioned the fact that lawyers do not learn how to run a business in law school. That's, that's a huge one. It's something that I, you know, I mention a lot in uh, various videos that I do on Facebook, things like that. But what's interesting that you pointed out that I really haven't 
highlight it and I really should in some of my material is I have an MBA. I went to business school and let me tell you, there was zero education about how to run a small business in mm -hmm. business school. It was all, you know, I mean, there, there was class on, on, you know, cost accounting and, you know, and how to, and, 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 and manufacturing lean, you know, uh, lean manufacturing and, and yep. just in time delivery of stuff. None of it's relevant to anything that I'm doing as a, as a small business owner. Um, and none of it is relevant to any of my clients, any of my attorney law firm owner clients either. So the fact that you didn't get a business education in law school just means you're on the same playing field as every other small business owner in the United States of America and probably in the world. Yep. The education that we get is from coaches, mentors, listening to others who have had success and the school of hard knocks. Learn, you know, my mother always said, sometimes you learn with your ears and sometimes you learn with your butt, you know, and, and, <laughs> and that's what it is with entrepreneurship. It's, you know, sometimes you, you're listening, you're reading, you're, 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 you're soaking up somebody else's mistakes in that way and you're, and you're becoming a better person from it. And sometimes you just have the cost of education in the financial mistakes that you make and the decisions you make in your business. And that's how you become a better business owner. And that's why I think this podcast is like something that everybody should be listening to every single week, uh, because that's what I'm doing here. I'm bringing you information on how to be successful, how to, how to be a successful business owner. Um, and it's, you know, it's people like Brett and any, any of our other guests that you've heard that bring you know, this knowledge to you. So uh, that's one thing that I wanted to go back to. The second thing is a staffing. Uh, my story, and I don't know if I shared this in past podcasts, so I'll share it here. My father has always been, you know, he's always been himself. He never wanted to work for somebody. So he's, you know, he was a jewelry salesman. Then he started a, a local flower delivery business that he ran out of the basement. Then he did a, cons um, a, a closeout business where he would buy stuff that was, you know, going for pennies and, and, and he would look at it and say, okay, why is this not selling? Um, and then he would try to repackage it in a way that it would sell better and then sell it for a significant premium on that. Um, throughout that process, I was employed in his business, not officially, and we never got paid. We just had to do it in order to keep, a, you know, keep stay in the house. But um, one of the things we did, like there was a game, Plutocrat, it, when you opened it, it had no instructions. So no wonder people didn't like the game. It had, you know, like you had to figure out how to play it yourself. It was ridiculous. So we came up with our own way of playing the game. We wrote an instruction manual. Um, it also came with all the pieces loose. So, you know, it was just a mess when you opened the box. So we repackaged all the pieces into little Ziploc bags and put an instruction manual in and then, you know, shrink, shrink, shrunk wrap it. And then he turned around and sold that to, to stores. And, um, and, you know, so that was the kind of, kind of stuff that we were being exposed to. He also did gold refining at some point and he would buy garbage bags of, of glasses that were being thrown out by, these, by, by um, eyeglass companies. Cause apparently there's like a little tiny bit of gold that's used in the manufacture of glasses. And he would melt all that down to get the little tiny bit of gold out of it and then turn around and sell the, the gold nuggets. The list that goes on and on of the things that he's done. But what I noticed in growing up under, you know, you know, in that environment is he was always by himself that he was always doing all the work and he was never, he never like hired somebody to do any of the things for him. And I view that even now he's been very successful the last 15 years as an access database programmer. And I've pushed him many, many times. Like, why don't you bring on other access database programmers? Why don't you go beyond yourself? And he's just happy, you know, being by himself. That's what he wants to do. But I saw a bigger vision for him that he didn't see. And I, and I realized early that the way to build a business is to have staff, is to have other people doing the work for you. And kudos to all the solos who decide to stay solo. But the reality is, is you're not an entrepreneur. You're, you're really not a business owner. You're, you just are paying yourself a paycheck that somebody else could easily pay you if you work for them. You just don't want to have a boss. So you're your own boss in a job. And when you start to recognize that the key to growing a true business is to have staff doing work for you, that's when you can start to look at everything that you're doing and say, okay, what are the seats I need to fill so that I could be the most productive person that I can be? 
And that's why I love what you're doing with Get Staffed Up and the fact that you have 10 associates working for you and, you know, and have grown your firm to where you, where you have it uh, is that, you know, it, it's not about being a lawyer. It's about building a business where you can serve your clients in the best way possible. And there's no way that you could be the best person at your bookkeeping and accounting, the best person at rece receptioning and answering your phone, oh. the best person at making sales, the best person at managing the client relationship. Uh, there's no way you can wear all those hats and be best at all of them. There are people who will do each of those jobs better than you. So why not have them work for you and have the most amazing experience for your clients? Mm -hmm. and you just back and enjoy and reap the benefits. Yeah. I mean, look, you, you were on a roll there at motion. I, I didn't want to interject, but there were so many points I want to say absolutely. And add something for, first of all, it sounds like you and I were cut from the same cloth because believe it or not, my, my last name's Trembley, obviously our family had a jewelry store for 47 years. So, um, after world war II, my grandfather went to watchmaking school and then found a little town, believe it or not in New Mexico, where I grew up that um, had a, the train, it was like a hub for the train stations and he would fix all of the rail rotors watches. And then my dad bought the business, et cetera. So um, I know about, you know, the jewelry business a little bit and, and the gold, et cetera. And the other thing I want to say is it sounds like, you know, your dad's somebody I want to hang out with. I, on the other hand, kind of like your dad would, would buy things and sell things as a kid. And, and that was a fun thing that I like to do. Um, and I think that maybe people that work on their own. So I, I truly believe this to each his own. If you're truly happy doing everything yourself, and that's just the way you, you, you work and you operate fine. But most people aren't, they're just lying to themselves, worst of all, and to everyone else, pretending that they're happy to be that way. If you you know, we all know the, I mean, criminal defense, that, that's a little harder to scale, but um, you know, you've got the, the 55 to 60 year old estate planning attorney. He's got one paralegal that does everything else. And that it's been those two, you know, for, for 20, 25 years. Um, I mean, if you really got an honest answer out of them, would they rather have the situation that I'm in? And I, and I, I don't want to come across like, you know, look, look at me, but I don't practice law anymore. I run the business, I make sure clients are taken care of. My main job is recruiting incredible staff people and, and teammates because after, after a while, you can't grow the business doing everything yourself. You have to bring on the right people and put them in the right seats. Um, building teams is one of the, the most fun things that I've ever been a part of. I love the leadership aspect and building the teams and empowering other people to do all the things you were just mentioning from the low end to the high end. Um, so would, would they trade with me or I'm, you know, have a 10 attorney law firm and I'm not actually having to practice law or would they want to continue to slave away? I mean, look, I don't have as much stress as I once did. I, that's just a fact. And so that by itself makes my life way better. And the only way to do that was to realize what you just said. You cannot be all things, to all people and do all the positions in your business that a business needs. And the longer I go into this thing, so I would have said eight years ago that if I had 10 attorneys, I would be island hopping on my private helicopter. That was kind of my, my immaturity at the time because I didn't have a business that big. So if I would have, you know, back then you would have told me I was doing the kind of numbers and revenue, I would have thought, wow, I, I own the whole, the whole city. It's not like that. We still have people that should only have one hat that still wear multiple hats because as you, realize a, you know a business needs one person in one seat and there's so many different things a business needs if you don't have an assistant Moshe you are an assistant and and you can't argue with that it's a fact if you're answering your own phones you're you're acting as a secretary in that moment if, if you're doing your own paralegal work you're paralegal if you're, you're doing your own junior attorney work you're a junior attorney if you're doing your own senior attorney then you're a senior attorney and then sometimes you're the business owner and people and I just emphasize that because when people fight that and I was there, so I'm not better than anybody. I, I refuse to hire someone because I thought you had to have the money in the bank account for maybe a whole year before you could hire them. But what I really found out was if I hired someone and I found this out through a lot of reading and self analysis, but if you hired someone and then I had to fire them, I would be looked at as a failure. Like, Oh my gosh, Brett tried to hire and then he had to fire someone. What a loser. 
people are too busy to care about me. So let me turn that around. People are too busy to care about you so much. Maybe a few people want to see you fail, but but that's few and far between. I remember the first time I sent my my first e-newsletter, I hit the enter button, you know, to send and I stood up and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, what did I just do? This is a big thing. I don't even know what goes out anymore for the most part. It, the, the world doesn't revolve around me. The world doesn't revolve around you. You have to quote unquote, get over yourself and you're never going to have the money in the bank. I mean, maybe you're a PI attorney, you, you win a big case, but you have to hire someone and realize that if you, if you do it the right way, that person's going to make you money. So here's the example. It's the summer of 2014. I finally hired an in-house law clerk, a law student, but I made her do my assistant for everything, right? She was, she was doing now all the phone answering, et cetera. And I doubled my law firm revenue the next month. And I'm like the very first month that I had her. And I thought, how did that work? How stupid am I? I mean, it's just math. If you build 10 hours a week and then you build 20, that's twice as much revenue. Of course, you're going to double. It, it's just, it's, it's such a simple concept, but it's hard for people to pull the trigger and grow because they don't trust the data. They don't know their numbers, especially, and they just can't see how hiring someone is going to make them more money. They look at it as an expense and people have such a hard time getting over that, that I, I just, just emphasize all the time because when you see someone get it and the light bulb goes off and then they invest in themselves, it's a great feeling. It doesn't, doesn't really make a difference in my life, but it's such a great feeling when somebody just does it and they grow and they give someone else a job that wants the job and will be better at them and they themselves get better. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. There's so many things that you said that I, you know, I'd love to go back and and highlight, Um, but go all the way back to the beginning of, of what you were just talking about Uh, somebody who's, who's a solo and you gave an example of, you know, the 55 year old who's got his, he's been in practice for 20, 30 years and he's got his paralegal and it's just the two of them. I want to point out that being a business owner means um, bringing in help, however that looks. It doesn't mean you have to be a 10 associate firm. You can stay a one attorney firm where you're the attorney and still have yep. Smith AI doing your, your yep. virtual reception services. You get staffed up giving you an admin person to do your administrative work. Having a, a virtual paralegal services yep. company and giving you a, a paralegal. We had uh, one here on the podcast just uh, a, a few weeks ago. Um, I don't know when this episode will be released, uh, but her name is Jacqueline Foster. And I'm just going to check the episode number real quick. I think it's 122. Um, so folks, if you go back and look at episode, um, just pulling it up here on my phone. Yeah. Episode 122, virtual paralegal services with Jacqueline Foster. You know, th- there are so many options to get help. That doesn't mean I have to hire a full-time staff person. And that's like the big hangup is, oh my gosh, I can't commit to ha- paying somebody a salary when I can't predict that their stuff is going to come in um, and the business is going to continue to flow. And what Brett pointed out is that it's, you got it backwards. It's not, it, it's which came first, the chicken or the egg. It's not the work that comes first. And then you hire the person. You hire the person first. And that makes room for more work. And that's how you're able to handle more clients. What happens is what you don't see happening is that you're not seeking new business when you're busy. And because you're busy all the time, you're almost never seeking new business. Yep. And if, as soon as you offload that work, you're now ready to accept new business. And that's when it's going to come to you. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not so much like a woo thing. Like, oh, I open up to the universe and, and, and the universe will fill it. It is part of that. That's part of it. But part of it. the reality is, is that it's just simple effort and energy that you're putting into the business. And the more that you, that you re- recognize, like here's, here's another way to flip what you were saying. Um, who is going to make a better business owner? Somebody who is, a, who is spending all of their time focused on how am I going to make the business better and grow the business now and not doing anything else or somebody who's spending maybe an hour to five hours a week in that role and doing that thing. Yeah. Here, and there's no, there's no comparison. No. And here's the analogy just to interject real quick that I use when I'm, when I'm trying to get this point across to people. Cause I think just, just, attorneys we're so hard headed. It's like, Oh yeah, well I can do everything myself. I, I can't hire it's like who, who's going to have a better restaurant. The guy that spends all his time uh, secret shopping his own restaurant um, 
you know, getting quality surveys, quality assurance, making sure that his host or hostess is the best in the business, making sure that, you know, that the, the, the napkins are folded, that everything's being taken care of, that he, he hired the best chefs in the world or the restaurant owner that's his own host, his own waiter, his own chef, his own server, you know, line, line chef and his own business owner, his own bookkeeper. It, I mean, the list goes on. It, it's so intuitive that you, you, you can't have a good business when you do everything yourself. That's the part that, that, that people don't get, you know, no offense, but you, if you're truly a solo or even, you know, a little bit of help, you, you can't have a great business. You can be a good attorney, but you're never going to make the kind of difference for, for people that I think most lawyers want to make. And you're right. You don't have to have a 10 attorney firm. That's not what this is about. In fact, I know um, a probate lawyer who just crunched his numbers and he figured out what his most profitable services were. And with two attorneys and a few staff people, you know, he, he's in the type of law where it's more systematized and, and conveyor belt. He's going to be based on his numbers. And I believe him just as profitable as we are with the firm, a third of the size. That's awesome. Good for him. It doesn't, there's not one size fits all. You don't just have to grow to grow, but you right. can't do everything yourself. Absolutely. And, and I, I couldn't agree more. Like you said earlier, each person is, you, you're your own person. You get to design what life you want to have, what kind of firm you want to have. But there's no, there's no question that if you're just yourself with no help at all, that you probably have a really hard time taking a vacation. And if you do, you're, you're probably losing business or hurting your client service in, in the process, or you have to take only a week and you can't take a two week vacation or you can't take a three week vacation. Um, and that's just one, you know, highlight, just, it's just highlighting where the, where the problem lies. Um, the reality is, is that there is ebbs and flows. And there are times that you're probably way overwhelmed that you just can't handle all the things and something has to suffer from it. And maybe you're apologizing to your clients about it, or maybe you're not. And you know, your clients are just wondering like, what the heck is going on? Uh -huh. um, so my belief is that even if you're a solo, there are ways to get help that doesn't require you making a massive investment, massive change yep. in your business. Um, but your restaurant analogy, by the way, I use that all the time. I use it slightly differently. I use it to portray why it's important to invest in your law firm. Um, in, nowadays, people, um, because starting a business is so easy, you know, 30, 40 years ago, in order to start a business, even a law firm, you needed tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank to start your firm because you had to take a lease in an office space. You had to uh, buy a spot in the yellow pages, which wasn't cheap. You had, you know, there wasn't a way to advertise. You weren't allowed to advertise. There wasn't the internet. Um, you know, it was all either word of mouth or people look you up in a phone book. Um, and you had to bring on staff in order to, in, in order to manage the process because you weren't able to track everything with software and have people do things on their book, their own calls and pay their invoices online and all that stuff. So there was a lot more manual stuff going on. You had to invest a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars into your firm just to get started. Yep. And people would work for 20 years to save enough to be able to start their own firm. You don't recognize how easy you have it today, but at the same time, because you have it so easy, we're, we tend to think, oh, I'm just going to start and I don't need anything. And the reality is, is sure, I can find a ton of examples of people who started with nothing. Brett might be one of them where they didn't invest any money in their firm, really. They just kind of put sweat equity in and they built it and figured it out and, and moved from there. Uh, but people, somebody who's willing to invest $50,000 in their firm and bring on some staff initially and hire a marketing agency and, you know, do a few of the things like think of what is, you know, what do I want? I want a $500,000 firm. What does that look like? What if I actually fronted the money yeah. to, to have the firm look that way when I didn't have that level of revenue, but now we have, we're, we're geared for it and we, and, and very quickly grow into it. The speed to get to where you want to go is truncated. It's significantly expedited, like from one, one year to five years. Like it might take you five years if you started on your own with no capital and no investment and not realizing that this is the way to go versus I start and I actually bring on people that are going to help me sell, that are going to help me produce and, and, you know, and help me market and spend that money up front. 
you'll probably get to where you want in a year, 18 months, instead of taking five years to get there. And I think that that's, so the analogy I use is the restaurant where somebody wouldn't open a restaurant without any investment. That would be asinine. They would, they would have to be everything. They would have to be the chef, be the, be the waitress, be the waiter. They, those, their, their ability to succeed in that market would be extremely limited from day one. So people just, they know that that's not going to work. So they don't do that. They, they save for 10 years until they have enough capital to be able to start their own restaurant. And then they open it up. And unfortunately, a lot of them fail. And, you know, people work, work their whole life to save to start that business and it's not successful. But there's so many places to access capital. And I think that it's a big mistake that law firm owners make not recognizing that you need to invest in your business. And sometimes that in, often that investment happens before the return. You know, if, if, if putting money in the stock market, you made the money first and then you made the investment after, you know, we'd all be doing that. Right. <laughs> um, you know, exactly. it, it, it's pretty intuitive that you need to put money in, in order to have a return out. And I think that, you know, people, we, we operate from, I'm going to put time in and take money out. And the reality is, is that you only have so much time. It's a very yeah. finite resource. Oh, exactly. You know, I mean, you can, that, you can put money in and replace the time. Exactly. Exactly. That's a sad example you gave. Imagine 10 years of your life. What's that worth? You know, some people are so risk averse and I, I, I was, I was this way again. I was uh, so afraid of failure, but 10 years, I mean, it, it sounds, it sounds awful losing money, but it sounds way worse losing 10 years of your life. So I, I tried to get um, some sort of grant or loan. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I had, I had no uh, ability to get one. I didn't have any assets or collateral. So I, I, was, I was denied. I was in credit card debt, family, you know, no, no money to speak of. My, my, after my dad sold the jewelry store, he was a teacher and my mom and my stepfather as well. So um, I had to bootstrap. But looking back, I mean, I could have sped up, like you said, you know, three to five years by having some sort of capital investment. And it's not like it hangs over your head and you got to pay, pay it all back. If it's 50 grand, you make payments, big deal, just like you do on anything else. But forget that because I don't really know the world of, of borrowing to start a law firm. Um, of course, a lot of our clients were a business law firm. So we, we help them do that, you know, for starting their business. But in terms of, of this audience, there are so many resources where you can get fractional help. You can so get staffed up. We do only full-time staffing because the price point is so ridiculously reasonable that it doesn't make sense to do part-time. So, um, but you can do a lot of fractional services to get help for not that much and grow your law firm so much more quickly if you just invest in yourself and those resources. Yeah, absolutely. And I kind of alluded to that earlier when I mentioned, you know, use Get Staffed Up for admin, use uh, Jacqueline yeah. Foster for paralegal, use Smith AI for reception, you know, your ability, uh, a law clerk, use law clerk for, to fill in the legal work. You know, your law clerk is uh, a marketplace where you can find contract attorneys to do specific things for you. Um, so Law Clerk was a sponsor of our Law Firm Growth Summit back in December of, of 2019. And folks, stay tuned because we're about to announce the next summit coming up soon. It's going to be um, in, in November of 2020. Really excited about what we're creating there. Um, Smith AI, also a uh, sponsor of many of our events, including the Law Firm Growth Summit uh, last year. So these are, you know, these are great companies and, and, you know, that's why I was really excited when I met uh, Brett here on, you know, in, in the green room before the, before we started this interview, uh, because what he's doing with Get Staffed Up is, is, is great for, for the law firm who's trying to figure out, okay, how do I get help, but I'm not ready. I don't have the capital or I don't have, or I'm not ready to make a commitment to uh, somebody, you know, local full-time at, at a significant significant cost to our, you know, our, uh, our overall uh, p &L. So Brett, let's jump into Get Staffed Up. What is it? Um, what does it do? What kind of help do you provide? Um, and maybe even share some examples of, of you know, what it might cost to, to, uh, yeah. to, to, you know, to get somebody on board. Absolutely. I mean, our, our pricing is right on, on our website. So i um, very happy to share. And, and the example I'll give is I was paying somebody, I still love this girl to death. I really wish she was a, a team member, um, but I had to make a tough decision at the time, uh, three, three or so years ago, I couldn't justify the $60,000 salary that I needed to pay this person when you include withholding and benefits and the overhead 
and the insurance and, and the office space and all the things that people don't add in. Employees, in domestic employees cost anywhere from 1.25 to 1.45% um, more than you're paying them. So you can just tack on another 25%, let's say to, to use a, a low number. So if you're paying someone 100, they cost you as the business owner 125. Um, right. We call in, in the accounting world and the, in the business management world, we call that the loaded cost of the employee. So yeah, the, what the exactly. employee's salary is, is just what they think they're getting paid. But the loaded cost includes your payroll taxes, your health insurance. If you, if you're, you know, matching money in a 401k, uh, mm -hmm. workman's comp, uh, unemployment insurance, the list goes on and on and on. Um, uh, you're, on. You're, you're right on. I, I use yeah. a factor of 1.3 as a general rule but it could, it's anywhere from, from 25 to 45%. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it depends, right? So I, I'm just trying to be conservative to not oversell this thing. Right. So um, what we did is my business partner hired four people out of the Philippines. It just so ha he had a real estate law firm just so happens that three of his people moved like all within a month. He found out about this concept and, and he did it. And I said, Holy, Holy cow. And he, and he, he still has a lot of the same people with him. Um, who have now moved on to get staffed up. So I should say with us. And I asked for one at my law firm and, and she's still with me. She was fantastic. And the cost saving, it was about, it was about a third in other words. So we have three price points just, just to answer that part of the question, 1650 a month, 1850 a month and 2050 a month, depending on the type of what we call staffer or virtual assistant that you need. So all of those price points are about at 20 or, or just, you know, in the low twenties or high teens, when you, you know, you can't get an admin person for, especially in Miami, less than 40, 45. And again, now you got to tack on, you know, the extra 30%. And so we do three, we have three positions, Moshe. We do, we don't do attorneys. We don't do paralegals. We do administrative staff only, right? Where a lot of people lose their time and they don't realize they're losing their time. We do um, virtual receptionists, virtual intake coordinators, client happiness directors, legal assistants, um, personal assistants. That's our 1850 price point. And I want to mention that these are no longer people from the Philippines. A lot of people think about outsourcing or, or offshore and they think India and the Philippines. Um, we do still have people from the Philippines that are at our lowest price point. Those are the clerical um, data entry, e-filing, like file clerk, scanning, you know, sort of big volume type stuff that doesn't require a lot of interaction. You have the different time zone and, and just being frank, you have an, an accent issue. So what we did and what differentiates us, we don't have a big building like in the Philippines filled with sardines and we're trading time for hours. Well, you need five hours. We got someone 20 hours. And that, that to me, that's a horrible business model and it wouldn't be fun. Our employees, cause there are legal employees and they work for you full time. So they are, um, in Mexico, Central and South America. So you have a lot of cultural similarities, um, a lot of great English schools, and we're only hiring people with impeccable English, you know, reading and writing. And you have the time zone, which is a huge factor. So we go out and we use our proprietary process to find really great applicants. This quarter, Moshe will have 5,000 people apply to work with us and only 50 will get a job and be placed with a law firm. So we, it's, it's 1%. I mean, we, we are getting the top 1% of all applicants because of how difficult it is to get through our recruiting process. So you hire us, um, we have a call, you pay the onboarding fee at 1750 and we find someone, we present them to you, you do the interview and you decide if you wanna hire this person or not. You know, we send you the materials and some videos before. If not, then we move on to the next one. But when you find the person you want, cause it's not like we're just giving you who we want. It's ultimately your choice as the business owner. Now they're a full-time employee and you pay us a flat fee every month and we take care of all of the back end. All those things that, that you had the exhaustive list on top of your head, we take care of all that in each country. There's a lot of rules and regulations that we have to follow. And that's it. You've got a really appreciative, hardworking, great person, full-time. There's no split loyalty. There's no split hours working only for you as a team member that you want to treat just like a team member, right? Include them in your huddles, include them in your daily meetings, include them in, in fun company announcements, include them on the website, make them feel a part of your team 
And, you know, the reason we're growing so fast is people are saying, is this, is this really this good, Brett? You know, sign up. I promise you won't be disappointed. I need another one. You know, most of our clients get a second virtual assistant from us within the first six months. And most of our business has been word of mouth because when someone else explains what they're doing through us and how great it is and how cost effective it is, because that's a big part of it. I mean, we're, we're just getting referrals left and right. And, and we haven't really even started down the marketing and, and promotion road yet because we spent so much time working on our own systems and processes. We already have 15 of our, our own employees, all virtual from other countries. So um, the third price point is the marketing virtual assistant. And that's the 2050 per month. So you really want to supercharge your media. Most companies here want to charge you about that much for, I don't know, 10 Twitter and 10 Facebook posts and a newsletter. It's like, that's all you're getting for that kind of price point. You can have 50. We have a program where we can teach you to have, you shoot one, one minute video yourself and your virtual marketing assistant can pump out 54 pieces of content for that, from that one video that you did. You could do that every day. You can be everywhere like I am. You have your LinkedIn managed, your email managed, your Facebook managed, your Instagram, your newsletters. And you're like we talked about, you're not, you're not dealing with any of it except the approval and possibly you know, the messaging and the vision. So I don't want to go on, but I could because it's very exciting. The, the cost-effective resources that we're bringing to law firms. Oh my goodness, Brett, you got me sold. Sign me up. I need three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is, yeah, you know, what, what's interesting is, is that as I've had questions, you just went and answered the question with just what you were describing. Uh, one of the challenges that I have, so I have staff in the Philippines and one of the challenges I have is the time zone thing. I'm not going to make somebody work during their night. Um, that's just not something that not a relationship I want to have. I'm, I'm all about helping people and giving them a better life. The last thing I want to do is have somebody work a night shift just to be able to work for me during my business hours. So it limits what I'm able to do. So I love that you've been able to go to other places where you've solved that problem. Uh, the English language is also uh, uh, a challenge. Um, my staff in the Philippines is not customer facing. They're not, um, uh, to an extent they are with email marketing with, with, or email, uh, emails that they're sending, but they're all scripted by me so that they're not writing the email themselves because otherwise it, it would not sound right when it was received on the other end. Um, so it's got its limits. And I was wondering how you're navigating around that. Yeah. So you answered all of that by, you know, where you're getting your staff and where they're coming from. And I love that. Here's what, what I'm sure some of the people who are listening to this are thinking. And I would like to know what you do to get around this challenge. So many people who are looking at hiring their first person or getting their first bit of help. And now they're saying, oh, this sounds amazing. This is, I'm ready to do this. I can invest $20,000 a year. I couldn't invest 60,000 plus you know, overhead, you know, which brings it closer to 70, 75, um, but I could invest 20 and get help. But I don't know what to give them. And I don't know how to instruct them. And I don't, you know, how do I, how do I, um, you know, how do I know that I'm ready, that I, that I have, everything to hand off to is there uh is there some sort of you know standard procedure or process to be able to offload that work so that's where uh, i'm sure people are going right now saying this sounds great but i can't do it because i'm not ready because i don't have systems and processes in place i don't have a, a thing that i could just hand off and say here go do this so is that something that you come across and and yeah. how do we deal with that all the time i'm actually I'm not just saying this. I'm very glad you asked this question because this is like, this is who I was. And man, I wish somebody had just told me this back in, in late 2011 when I started my firm or, or 2012. So there are thousands of lawyers right now that are so stressed out because we talked about, you know, being a true solo. You know how stressful it is to go spend three hours in court and come back and go like, oh, I don't want to open. I mean, look, we have email on our phones now, but or just to get out of the courtroom where the judge can't see and you look at your email and a client's asking for something, another client's disappointed. And then you have like a, an email of a new client. So which one do I answer? You know how unbelievably frustrating and stressful you can never get out of that. Like you said, you can't even take a vacation without losing referrals and business. Oh man, the stress that I used to have on vacations. I was trying to enjoy my family. Holy cow. So he, here's the deal. Nobody, nobody teaches us this, but here's the easiest way to do this, Moshe. Spend one week 
Write down how you spend your time. We got to log our, our billable time, right? Write down everything you do. I answered the phone. I, I went to the bathroom. I'm serious. Just write down everything. Highlight all the crap that you hate doing that, that, and don't, I don't want people to do this. Like I say, well, highlight all the stuff you can give away to someone. And people are like, oh, I can't give that away. I can't give that away. It's such nonsense. You can give away 99% of just, yes, you can. Just highlight the things you don't want to do or the things that annoy you or the things that don't make you money. Do that for a week. That's your job description. You're going to have, I go back to the email management. If you call us today and that sounds like I'm selling something, right? Call us today. Um, if, if we were able to get you and we can, of course, an, an administrative assistant for $18.50 a month, just to do your email and your calendar, you will have so much more time. I would argue 25 hours per week to work on whatever systems you want to bill more. You will pay for that person tenfold. You know, what are we talking about? Five hours a month of more billable time. They're going to save you 25 a week. You have to get a personal assistant to do all those admin tasks early. That's going to put more time on your plate to start developing. Well, let me Google how to make a real job description for my next hire. Let me do five more hours of legal work this week for an extra fifteen hundred dollars. Right. I, it, it, that's what you do. Moshe. you write down how you spend your time and then you chronicle it. You batch it up. Mostly it's going to be your email, your messages, your calendar, your phone answering stuff. You give it away and you will, you will feel so liberated with the amount of work that you just got off your plate. Oh, awesome. Absolutely awesome. I, I teach a similar exercise to what you, just, what you just described, but I learned it from Michael Hyatt. I'm sure you're familiar with Michael yeah. Hyatt. So yeah. in his book, Free to Focus, he goes, was through this this um, this four quadrant you know chart. Uh, basically, there's two types of of ways to measure what we're doing. There's how proficient am I at it. So there's a proficiency level, and then there's a desirability level. Like what? How do, How much does it excite me? And basically, what you do is is you you rate those two. So you make a a, a spread sheet with you know the list of activities and then you in one column you put your desirability level and you rate it like a one to four you know choose something that's easy to to grade and then you choose, you put your proficiency column and you rate how proficient you are one to four and the stuff that you are that you rate highest on both is the stuff that you want to keep the stuff you rate lowest on both is the first things you want to get off your plate and mm -hmm. that's how you 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 know you 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 back into it and and grade that so I love, I love that. And, and um, do, are your admin assistants familiar with pieces of software or is that just like any employee you need to, you need to train them to use your stuff and, and get access to your, you know, to your, your pieces of software and all that. Yeah. I mean, go, going, going into Mexico, for example, and finding people that know how to use Clio or rocket matter. I mean, <laughs> that, that would be nearly impossible. We do get that question, but these aren't unicorns, right? They're just really talented human beings that happen to be born in a different country than us. So you got to train them. You got to onboard. It's going to take four to six weeks to ramp up and get the production at really peak capacity, just like it does for any other employee you're ever going to hire unless you're poaching them or bringing them, you know, they, they want to join your firm from another firm where they have experience, but guess what? You got to pay those people a lot more. So these are, what we like to say, um, their talent. And, and a lot of them have been personal and executive assistants for other people, by the way. So, so these are not like just all fresh, uh, you know, out of college that there are very experienced people, but the software is, is going to be a challenge mm -hmm. like it is for anybody. Right. And uh, what about turnover? Um, do you, what is, what is your turnover rate? Because uh, people leave, right? They, they leave, whether it's, you know, an employee I hired that says, Hey, I'm, you know, moving to live near my grandma who's sick, or, you know, I found a better job somewhere else. And yeah, you know, so turnover is, is always an issue and you spend a lot of time training somebody, getting them, you know, and finally you get everything working perfectly. And, you know, and, and this employee is fully productive. And then all of a sudden they're like, Hey, I'm leaving. So, uh, a turnover is, is a real thing, whether it's through get staffed up or somebody that I hired, what does your tone turnover look yeah. like, uh, at, at get staffed up? Moshe, it, I mean, we haven't met before today, right? I just want to no. confirm. Right? Yes, we met it's today. Not, this was it, not a teed up question. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's almost like we're, we're all buddies and, and, and you're throwing me softballs here. Um, if you're frustrated with turnover, it's cause it's cause you're ignoring life. People are not put on this planet to work for you their whole lives to make your life so great. 
a turnover happens so often because who's who wants to keep the ten dollar receptionist job their whole life who who doesn't want to you know get promoted and move on to better things for their family you should want that for your people or or you're maybe not you know a good person to work for so it, it's almost like i sent you the business plan motion because one of our 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 uniques as we call them is the here's here's the saying we solve your high turnover position at your three highest turnover uh Oh, see, now I screwed it all up, right? We solve the high turnover problem at your three highest turnover positions, which is your clerical positions, your admin positions, and your marketing positions. Because, you know, stateside, it's so hard to find a good receptionist and keep them unless it's maybe somebody retired who just is bored. Um, it's really hard to keep good intake people. It's really hard to keep um, marketing coordinators. So uh, we are, are, look, look, we're still hiring human beings. And it happens. We have people show up on day one and they don't want to work for that person or they flake out. But it is so much more rare so far for us than it is here in the United States. We have an 85% retention rate. 85% of our clients have had the same staffer for longer than nine months. So, you know, again, it's not perfect. We're not promising you perfection, nor would we. Um, but our, our, this is, this is our goal is to convince you that you will always have turnover problems. If you keep hiring locally and domestically and possibly the way to fix that and to stop what, what you just described is the training new person, the hiring, you know, that the hidden cost of hiring is $5,000. So every time someone leaves, you're losing $5,000 by going through the whole process, not to mention the lost, you know, productivity. It's cheaper than that to hire through us anyway. And so, you know, this is, again, one of the things where I'm so emphatic about what we're doing for the legal community. There's nothing like it. And, and it's phenomenal. Now, in, in certain staffing uh, agencies where, where the staffing agency has the employee and, and you are paying the staffing agency, um, at some point, there's an option to take over that employee completely. Like, I want to bring them in-house. I want to actually have them on my staff. Um, do you have that option available for your clients? The things I'm thinking about is, what if I want to promote somebody? So they're, you know, they, they came through you. They're, they're amazing at what they do, but I want to move them into an elevated position in the firm. I'm kind of stuck in, you know, with, with the, the, thing, the position that I'm paying you for. You know, do, do, you, do you have that uh, um, success path for your employees available yeah. for them to move, you know, yeah. into a more permanent role with the law firm? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, it's actually better. So one, we have a buyout. So if you really want someone, you know, fine, you just buy them out from us because it is expensive for us, obviously. But better than that, Moshe, uh, we had one of our, our really good uh, attorney friends here in Miami, one of our first clients. She, we found her someone awesome right away. That girl just got promoted. Why does that mean anything has to change? She, she got a financial promotion. So now we're charging more of the client and, and, and the the virtual assistant's making more. She got more things put on her plate. But if we're giving you an admin assistant and you want to add, you know, s some extra things to their plate, it there's no need to buy them out. There's no need to change anything. You're just like, you're not hiring through us for a position. You're hiring a person. They're yours 40 hours a week. So whatever you give them for 40 hours a week, if they're good at it, then keep giving it to them. And there's really nothing that needs to change about our relationship. It's absolutely awesome. All right. Well, we are running out of time here. So uh, we're going to gonna wrap this up. Brett, this has been, this has been um, eye-opening, mind-blowing. I mean, there are people who are just on the other side uh, of this conversation listening to this and, and, and saying, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I needed. So um, can you share with them where they should go to find out more about getting started with Get Staffed Up? Absolutely. Get staffed up.com. Bottom line. You know what? No, here's this get staffed up, right? G E T S T A F F A D up. Just like it sounds get staffed up.com slash V I P that V I P link. Go ahead and mention this podcast and we'll move you to the front of the line for a sales call. And we'll even take $250 off your startup fee. If you mention this podcast. And so that is a direct link to our main salesperson if it's during business hours, she'll email you within the hour with some um, options to set up a sales call or as we call them decision making calls because we want people to make decisions, right? It's really a no brainer. Invest in yourself. 
And uh, that's the, the best and fastest way to contact us. Amazing. Brett, it's been, it's been wonderful. It's been a great conversation. Thank you so much for sharing so openly and, and, uh, and honestly with our audience and, and really helping me highlight something that I, you know, I talk about a lot and, and whether it's on the podcast or at my uh, coaching sessions uh, with my incubator members. Um, and by the way, if you are interested in becoming an incubator member, you can check it out at profitwithlaw.com forward slash incubator. Um, this is, you know, this is something that I'm very passionate about. I'm passionate about um, helping uh, law firm owners make their business, their, their, their law firm a, a profitable business venture. And um, this is a, a, an amazing tool in the arsenal that we just happen to connect. We happen to connect on LinkedIn. We, you know, got this, the, you know, this, this, uh, this podcast book. And I connected with you thinking here, I'm getting a really successful attorney. I can highlight, um, you know, with my, you know, with my audience. And then we started talking at the beginning and we're like, uh, and he, and you're like, get staffed up. Have you heard of it? And, uh, and, and I, my mind was blown. So uh, I'm a big proponent of, of finding, you know, inexpensive ways to, to really get past that, uh, that point of, Hey, I need help. And, and it's just, I, I don't have the ability to make that big jump and leap. Um, so my, I mean, my, my folks are going to be super excited about this option. Um, and uh, I hope you're ready to have your phone ringing off the hook. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, we would love that. So, all right, uh, Brett, I, I'm looking forward. I'm, I know that we're going to have other opportunities to highlight you. So I'm looking forward to bringing you back in, in other capacities, maybe as a, a guest at our, at our law firm growth summit coming up in November, 2020, uh, as well as uh, some other stuff that we have going on. So it's been a pleasure, uh, folks. Uh, once again, if this is your first time listening to the podcast, by now you see the kind of value that we bring, make sure you hit that subscribe button, and come back and listen to us again. We'll be back next Tuesday with a solo episode. It'd just be me talking you know, maybe, maybe it's interesting, maybe it's not, but then come back Thursday for another great guest interview. Those are always interesting. I may not be so interesting, but the guests are always very interesting. Um, and uh, the other thing is, is rating and reviewing this show. We don't get enough ratings and reviews. We, you know, no matter how many times I ask for it, it's, a, it, it's asking you to go out of your way and do something for me, which is, you know, it's always difficult because I'm not giving you anything in return, but I really am. I'm here twice a week in your ears, helping you providing content for you. I'm only asking for a small little favor for you to go back and rate and review the show. I don't care if you give me one star, just rate and review the show so that we get more ratings and reviews. Hopefully you'll like it. Hopefully you'll, you'll give us uh, really good positive feedback. Um, but regardless, we could really use more of those. So folks, go take specific action that's going to move your business forward this week. And maybe it's going to get staffedup.com forward slash VIP. Maybe that's the action you need to take today. Uh, but go take some action that's going to move your business forward. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that interview. I had an, a great time having that conversation with Brett. It was really eye-opening. And um, I am sure that many of you are thinking your wheels are spinning. You're trying to figure out, okay, how am I gonna how am I gonna do this in my firm? What am I gonna do? You learned a lot of the pieces of the puzzle in this episode, and I'm a firm believer. I'm growing. Uh, my belief for this is growing leaps and bounds every single day. You know, we we brought uh, Jack, Jacqueline Foster here on the podcast with Virtual Paralegal Services. We've had Kristen Tyler from Law Clerk here on the podcast. You literally could staff your firm with uh, workers that are specifically for a project, for, for something specific you have going on, or, or just the number of hours that you need, as well as uh, virtual uh, staff in a different country that um, doesn't affect your service model, doesn't affect your customer service or your client experience, but definitely saves you a ton of money in that commitment. So uh, one thing that happened after uh, the interview, I had a conversation with Brett and I negotiated with him to get you a better discount. So when you go to get staffed up and you want to try them out, uh, that $250 discount that he mentioned, well, I got him to double that. So just mention the Profit With Law podcast uh, or any or my name. Uh, let him know that, uh, that you heard about it here or you came uh, from a recommendation from me 
And um, that initial fee to get you started, which is one month's, uh, you know, one month's worth, depending on the position level that you're filling, uh, they will turn around and, and give you a $500 discount on that just for mentioning that you came through our, uh, through our show. So I just wanted to add this here on the end um, in case that is an extra motivator for you to do it. I'm a big believer in, you know, hiring more people than you need so that you can have the room to grow. Um, it, you know, it's amazing how many people get this wrong and um, wait too long to bring on the help that they need. Uh, so hopefully you'll take that step and try this out. Uh, I personally am using Get Staffed Up right now uh, to uh, bring on a, a few more VAs. We, you know, we had a, a number of open positions here um, and w they're, you know, they're currently in the matching process of finding the right candidates for us based on what we need. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm enjoying the experience so far. So uh, hopefully you'll get the same, the same level of uh, experience with this. And, um, you know, I, I really hit it off with Brett. I like him and uh, you know I think that they're doing a great thing for us so check it out uh, make sure to mention the Profit With Law podcast or Moshe Amsal and uh, you'll get that $500 discount when you sign up and uh, looking forward to hearing from you let, let me know how it went let me know how you're using the, the new staff that you bring on um, and how life changing that has become for you take care have you been enjoying the show we sure hope so to make sure you never miss an episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button in your podcast player app. Next week, we will be back with more valuable resources and ideas on how to break the mold and take your law firm to the next level.